time of worship. In our worship at this time, we remember and we observe the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ and all that it means for believers and followers of Jesus Christ. For those who believe Jesus Christ to be their Savior from their sin and death and the Lord over their lives and over their death. We begin our worship with a prayer. And actually the opening hymn is a prayer, Draw Us to Thee. So you're invited to pray or to sing this prayer as we begin. Scripture says at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Let us pray. Father, O God most high, who dwells in the highest of heavens, we praise you. Father, O Lord, most exalted, beyond our thoughts and imaginations, we praise you. We celebrate the victory of your Son, who has overcome death and saved us from the power of sin. We rejoice in his exaltation. Our great high priest, Jesus, has gone before, has entered into the Holy of Holies, and opened up a way for us to follow. In his name, we too would enter into your eternal presence. To him be all praise, together with you, O Father and the Holy Spirit, one Lord, the same in every age. Amen, amen and, and amen. amen. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from death to life and crowned him Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him or acknowledged his rule in our lives. We have gone along with the ways of the world and failed to give him glory. Forgive us and raise us from sin, that we may be your faithful people, obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, who rules the world and is head of the church, his body. Heavenly Father, please hear now the prayers of personal confession of sin that people lift up to you now from their hearts. From Romans chapter 8, verses 33 and 34. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. This is the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning to you. Our readings for this Sunday after the Ascension, come to us from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11, where we hear Luke's record of the Ascension itself. 
from Acts chapter 1, verses beginning with verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and the cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Here ends our reading from the book of Acts. And we read this morning from Luke chapter 24 where Jesus appears to his disciples and shares what is ahead for them. Jesus said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Jesus told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, near Jerusalem, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. Here ends the reading for this Sunday. We follow this by a special song for the ascension, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
Dear friends in Christ, last Thursday was the day Jesus ascended into heaven about 2,000 years ago. It's the day we observe that he ascended into heaven. 40 days after Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus ascended back into the heaven from which he came when he was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary, and when he was born in that crude manger to go to the cross for the sins of mankind against God and to rise from the dead to conquer death. Forty days after Jesus rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven to be in the glory which he deserves now for having come to earth and accomplishing the mission for which he was sent to earth of going to that cruel cross to pay the debt for mankind's sin against Almighty God and to rise from the dead conquering death. Forty days after Jesus rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven to be in the glory which he now has won for us, for all who believe him to be their savior from their sin and death and their Lord over their life and over their death. So my theme for our reflection right now from scripture is the rule of the ascended Jesus Christ and the rule of his power in the people of his mission. But before going on, I'd like you to view a video clip. This is also the seventh Sunday after Easter. It's a video clip that is entitled Easter, the final chapter. So before going on, I invite you to reflect on the message of this video clip. The life of Jesus has many landmarks on the way to the empty tomb. The story of Christmas reminds us that God didn't forget us in our sin, but sent His Son to save us. Good Friday reminds us of the pain and rejection that should have been ours, but that Jesus endured for us. And Easter Sunday reminds us that death has been defeated once and for all. But the story doesn't end with the resurrection. There is one more chapter that serves as an empowering transition for Christians today. The Ascension. After the resurrection, Jesus gave his disciples a clear mission and a powerful promise. Their new mission was to create disciples and to teach them everything Jesus had taught on earth. And the promise was that he would be with them always, wherever they went. And the Ascension was a tool that both started this mission and fulfilled the promise. The ascension meant that Jesus was no longer limited to his earthly body. Instead, he sent his Holy Spirit to dwell in us. He was no longer limited to human words. Instead, his spirit moves and confronts our hearts in ways that words can't express. And his gospel is preached not only to the Jews, but to every tribe and tongue and nation. So the Easter story was complete. Our debt was paid on the cross. Our death was defeated at the resurrection, and our mission was given at the ascension. And now, 2,000 years later, the mission and the promise are still the same. Jesus still desires that everyone would know and trust in Him, and He still promises to be with us through every struggle and triumph to the very end of our age. Which leaves us with one last powerful question. Am I on this mission? Because when we truly believe the Easter story, it calls us to more than a normal life. It calls us to give up our pride and fear of what others may think and to wholeheartedly go after the mission. What I want to highlight from this clip is that after Jesus ascended, when Jesus ascended into heaven, Jesus gave a clear mission and a clear promise to his believers and his followers. As recorded in Matthew 28, where Jesus said before he ascended, as you are going now for the rest of your lives, you go and make disciples of all nations, of all peoples, and lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And the video clip talked about how Jesus sent the Holy Spirit now for his disciples to begin, to get up off their rears now and to go out and be about the purpose and mission for which he was sending them into the world. Next weekend is Pentecost weekend. We'll spend time reflecting on that work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts and the lives of believers in Jesus Christ to be about his mission. But now the Easter story was complete. 
The debt for mankind's sin against God has been paid on the cross by Jesus Christ. Death has been defeated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And now the mission, his mission was given at Jesus' ascension. And this video clip ended with one last powerful question. Am I on this mission? Are you on this mission? Is Christ's church on this earth about his mission that he gave about going and making disciples? Is Christ's church at this place about his mission on earth? If you want to be about the mission and the purpose of Jesus Christ, how can it happen in us? How can it happen through us? And what I would offer right now is just, if you want to be about the mission and the purpose of Jesus Christ, start praying for it. Start praying for God's guidance and for the leading of God and to be equipped and to be enabled and to be empowered by God to be about the purpose and the mission of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Speaking of prayer, what I want to invite you to reflect on for the next moments is a prayer. A prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed for the people of a church in Ephesus. And he was praying for them that things would happen in them and through them to be about the purpose of the body of Christ on earth, the church. So I invite you to follow along as I read one more scripture reading from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 through 23, where the Apostle Paul writes, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Friends, this is a prayer for believers in Jesus Christ to know some things. And I want you to notice that it's not talking about knowing about these things. It's a prayer that believers and followers of Jesus Christ know some things. This word know that is in this passage isn't just about knowing about, like in head knowledge. It's very closely associated with the word experience. And so if anyone wants to be about the mission and the purpose of Jesus Christ, Paul is praying here that God's people would know Jesus better. Verse 17, I keep asking you that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Not just know about Jesus, but to know Jesus. You see, people can know about Jesus Christ, but not trust him, not respect him, not want to be about his purpose and mission. The devil himself knows about Jesus Christ and he shudders and shakes in his boots. You know, the book of James talks about. Paul prays here that believers in Christ may know him better. Paul prays also that believers in Jesus Christ may know, not just know about the hope to which he has called you. The hope. The hope that is based on God's word and God's promises. It's not a hope that's based on the situation and circumstances going around you in the world. We all hope that this pandemic goes away, that this virus that's floating around the world and putting every, everyone in the world at risk, we hope it would go away. But whether it goes away or not, in the short term or the long term, or never, you can have the hope. That's not based on whether a pandemic goes away or not. It's based on God's word and promises, come what may, in a sin-sick, fallen world. Paul prays here that believers in Jesus Christ would know, not just know about, the riches of his glorious inheritance of the saints. How's your financial situation these days? Losing money? Has your stock portfolio taken a hit because of the economy that's been crushed by this pandemic? If so, so what? You're still rich. 
Paul prays here that you might know the riches of his glorious inheritance. You have, inherit, you have been given the inheritance of heaven, everlasting life in heaven, through what Jesus Christ purchased for you, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. You're rich. And then Paul prays here, finally, that believers in Jesus Christ would know, not just know about his incomparably great power for those who believe. And then Paul goes on to describe and talk more about this power, this power of Jesus Christ. And I want to invite you to reflect on that for a few more moments. If anyone is going to be about the mission and the purpose of Jesus Christ in this world, of making disciples, it's going to be by his power. Because Paul reminds believers here that Jesus Christ has ascended and he is now ruling all over all things in his mighty power. We read earlier that God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every title that can be given, not only in the present age but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet. You'll notice here that the Apostle Paul says that Christ was seated far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. Take those four words, rule and authority and power and dominion, and put them in capital letters. Because these were the titles, these were the names that the Jews gave to the demonic forces that opposed God. And it's precisely these spiritual powers, these demonic forces that want to get in the way of the mission of Jesus Christ on earth being fulfilled, that Paul says Christ now rules over. He rules over through his ascension, through his exaltation. All things, Paul says, all things have been placed under Christ's feet and they're under his control. In, that, in the words of that old hymn we sang, Immortal, Invisible, O God, Only Wise, in the second verse, it confesses how you rule in might, your might. We profess that it is Jesus Christ who rules in his might. Every time we recite the Apostles' Creed, we affirm this belief that our God rules. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Whoever sits at the right hand of the King, that means that he's got all the rights, all the authority, and all the power of the King himself. But you know, it doesn't look like that, does it? It's not easy to affirm, is it? In the middle of a world that's gone mad, in the middle of a world with pandemics, floating, viruses floating around, you rule in your might? Shortly after 9-11, about a year or two after 9-11, there was an Anglican priest, Reverend Cam Rue, in England. He wrote some things that, that a lot of people read about, and he was very open uh, Reverend Cam, Cam Rue admitted that he has trouble seeing how the ascended Jesus Christ and everything that it means for us in, in being in, in power and authority, he admitted how hard it was that that could be true. He said, quote, take a look around you. Suicide bombers in New York City, old scores in war still being settled in Afghanistan, in Iraq. Children are abused by priests and ministers. Millions of babies die every year from poverty-induced diseases while arms traders are thriving in these regions. Our God rules? Do you think so? Does it look like it? He said the obvious fact is that on the face of it, God does not rule. His will is not done on earth as it is done in heaven." End quote. That's interesting. What do you make of this belief, the belief in the, of the ascension of Jesus Christ, that he rules over all things. On the face of it, with what we see with these eyes in our heads, it doesn't, doesn't look like it. Now one way we try and we can get around this obvious difficulty is to say that Christ rules, God reigns, but it's only begun now. And that, in fact, God will fully and finally and completely be fully victorious over the powers of evil in the future when Christ returns. And, of course, this is very true. The rule of God will reach its climax and its culmination in the future. However, the Apostle Paul here places the rule of Jesus Christ in the here and in the now. He says, in this present age. Christ has ascended, and he is now ruling over all things 
in his mighty power. And what's strange is that Paul says these things and it doesn't even seem to be a problem for him that the world is in such a mess. It seems that the Apostle Paul has no problem accepting the fact that God rules, Christ rules, even though the world around him is still a very, very messy place. And it is again now, today, in a pandemic, with viruses covering the earth, putting people at risk. Yet he can say, our God rules in this present age. And to some people, this might seem as ludicrous as Jesus when he stood before Pontius Pilate, half beaten to death, and saying, I am the king of the Jews. Doesn't look like it with those, these eyes. So how is it that Jesus could say these things? How is it that the Apostle Paul can speak of the rule of Jesus Christ, even though they can't see it with these eyes? Well, the answer is that they could see it, and we can see it with the eyes of faith, with the eyes of the heart. This is a prayer of Paul that the eyes of their hearts and of our hearts might be enlightened. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Did you know that your heart has eyes? In biblical language, the heart is the center of one's being. The book of Proverbs speaks of the heart as the wellspring of life from which flows out all of our motivations, our desires, our attitudes, our actions, our thoughts, our words, our actions. They all flow from the heart. And that's why it's very important to guard our hearts, to pay close attention to what is going into our hearts because what goes in is what comes out. And so the Apostle Paul could see, and he prays that we could see the, the power of Jesus Christ in all things with the eyes of the heart. Because, and they could see it because his power was living in them. They were experiencing that power in their own lives. Through all the hardships, through all the trials, the persecution, the oppression that was taking place of Christians, even so, for them, the ascension of Jesus Christ was not only about the empowerment of Christ that comes in the future, but also at the same time, the empowerment of Christ in the here and now, the empowerment of Christ in them. When Christ ascended, he gave power to his disciples. We uh, read in the book of Acts a few minutes ago about uh, how Jesus, before he ascended into heaven, made that promise to the disciples that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. And that came in a very special way on Pentecost Sunday. Again, we'll reflect on that next weekend with Pentecost weekend. But for now, this prayer in Ephesians 1 talks about four kinds of power that Christ gives his people. It says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Paul seems here to be going overboard, piling on some big words. In the original language of this passage, Paul is stringing together in quick succession four Greek words for power. The first word is dunamis. We get our word dynamite from it. That's the word here that's translated as power. And it's a reference to God's explosive power that can blow away things that get in the way of being a part of Jesus' mission and ministry. God's explosive power that can blow away guilt because sin is forgiven by Jesus' death and resurrection. It blows away fear because you have the promise that God is with you as you go forward in your lives and about Christ's purpose. Another word for power here is, is the word that's translated working. The word is energeia. We get our word energy from it, and it refers to God's never-ending energy for carrying out his mission. God's never-ending energy that perseveres and endures through such difficult, hard times on this side of heaven in a sin-sick, fallen world. A third word here is the word that's translated mighty. It's kratos. Kratos is the power of God to overcome obstacles that get in the way of the purpose and the mission of Jesus Christ. And finally, the word that's translated strength, iskuos, God's power to function effectively and efficiently, efficiently in the cause of God in Jesus Christ. These four words are thrust together in this passage 
to convey this extraordinary truth, the explosive power that God has, the energy God has, the strength of God, the efficiency that God has, he gives and it lives in each person who believes in Christ, who have Christ in them. And so I can just imagine there's people who are thinking, maybe some of you are thinking, well, thanks much for the compliment, Paul, but I'm so tired, I don't even have the energy to click the remote control to change the channels on the TV. I'm so tough that when my boss reprimands me, I go home and cry on the shoulder of my wife or my husband. The only obstacles I seem to overcome are those that go away all by themselves. And frankly, if you're saying I'm functioning with God's efficiency, I feel sorry for the rest of mankind. How can it possibly be that the power that brought Jesus Christ back to life lives in me? And how is it that you, Paul, cannot even see the problems going on in the world, even when they seem to be staring at, at you in the face? Well, take note of these words again, this prayer. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. The eyes of your heart, the eyes of faith. It's a matter of learning to look at life through those eyes, not the eyes of the head. We look around at what's going on around us with the eyes of the head and we sink. It's scary and it breeds sadness. Go to the cemetery, you go to the graveside, the grave marker of that dear departed loved one and you're looking down and you see with these eyes that dead body of your dear loved one buried in the ground. And it hurts. It stings. We miss him. We weep because of it. We see that with these eyes, with the eyes of the head. But with the eyes of the heart, we know that because Christ ascended, Christ ascended into heaven as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And that those who have died with him one day themselves, their bodies will rise and ascend to be in the glory, eternal glory which Jesus Christ won for us in his suffering death and in his rising from the grave. You look at that with the eyes of the heart, the eyes of faith. And as Paul would say in other places, we live by faith, we walk by faith, not by sight, not by what we see with these eyes. So how can it possibly be that the power that brought Jesus back to life lives in me? Well, to begin, start praying for it. Pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened as Paul does. Walk by faith, not by sight. Pray for, the, pray for and open the eyes of your heart of faith. See the ascended Jesus lifted up, ruling on high, living in you to his glory and the carrying out of his mission and purpose on earth. So, O oh Lord, grant it to us. Open the eyes of our heart. Enlighten the eyes of our heart and enable and equip us and empower us to be about the mission and the purpose for which Jesus is keeping this world going on for now. It's in your name, Jesus, that I ask this, and those who are in agreement may say amen and amen. As an act of worship, we continue to give offerings to the Lord. Thank you for those of you who have been giving offerings to support the mission and the ministry of his church here at St. Mark. Uh, you can continue to mail in offerings, uh, bring them by the offices, some of you have been doing or on the website, St. Mark's website, there is the Give Online link that you can use to give your offering to the Lord. I invite you to join with me in an Ascension Litany prayer. Arise, O Lord, in your strength. We will, we will praise, praise you for your glory. glory. Let us pray with joy to Christ at the right hand of God, saying, You, you are, are the King, King of glory. glory. You have raised the weakness of our flesh, heal us from our sins, and restore to us the full dignity of life. You are the King of glory. May our faith lead us to the Father as we follow the road you trod, Lord Jesus. You are the King of glory. You have promised to draw all people to yourself. Let not one of us be separate from your body. You are the King of glory. O King of glory and Lord of hosts, 
who ascended triumphantly above the heavens, do not abandon us, but send us the promised one, the spirit of truth. Blessed be the holy and undivided Trinity, now and forever. Amen. Hear us, Heavenly Father, as we lift up to you the petitions that Jesus taught his disciples to pray in his prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. Amen.